Um, so, um, I'd like to uh, speak today about possible intersections between uh, my research and the uh, project of Practice International. So, uh, you first. Uh, your project, as I understand it, is as follows. Um, in the context of the rapid internationalization of the arts, especially the visual arts, um, you are seeking an alternative model to um, a dominant globalization paradigm that breaks, um, as you put it, and I quote, with the narrative of mobility, circulation, and productivity linked to economic or diplomatic imperatives, unquote. Yet, the autonomous models uh, this group uh, seems to be seeking are not necessarily grand in scale. They can be intimate, minor, or based on subjective choice or poetics or friendship. Um, these themes are actually very, very close to my heart um, and work over the last two decades, nearly. Um, and in this time, I've been trying to canvas situated forms of ethics or self-work that speak to aggressive cultures of globalization. Okay. Imperialism, fascism, totalitarianism. By seeking a connection between the self and the world. This connection, often obscure, occluded and imperceptible, uh, concerns the history of various subjective, non-conformist, immature, inconsequential theoretical practices. Speaking about the uh, radical potential of this uh, connection between self and the world in 1942, the writer Arthur Kosler called it the bath of the yogi, as opposed to that of the commissar. In his words, and I quote from Kosler, the yogi believes that each individual is alone, but attached to the old one by an invisible umbilical cord, and that his only task during his advisedly earthly life is to avoid any action, emotion, or thought which might lead to a breaking of the cord. The avoidance has to be maintained by a difficult, elaborate technique, the only kind of technique he accepts." In what follows, I'll speak in general terms about my evolving work on this minor yet very revolutionary ethics of connection and put forth some questions and problems I've encountered along the way, possibly some solutions. Um, some time ago, when researching the colonized experience of contact, in the context of 20th century industrial imperialisms, 19th century industrial imperialisms for my book, Affective Communities, I came across this incredibly powerful scene of van der Sietler utopian socialisms. You know, nowadays, following the scientific and programmatic and parliamentary so socialisms of the 20th century, good, bad, and very ugly, um, we think of utopian socialisms, when we do at all, as marginal and crankish. A um, gentleman called H. M. Hindman, who was in his own uh, lunchtime the leader of the Social Democratic Federation in Britain, once described utopian socialism as the depository of old cranks, humanitarians, vegetarians, anti-vivisectionists, anti-vaccinationists, arty crafties, which they were. Um, <coughs> Yet, yet, utopian socialism was incredibly influential and life-transforming in Britain, of course, but also on the continent. So much so that Frederick Engels singled it out in his um, 1892 um, Socialism from Utopia to Science, however dismissively, as the competing radicalism um, for Marxism. So let me describe this scene briefly, because I think it has a lot to say to us. It was a creature of the 1880s. It was born in reaction to Gladstone's liberal government, which was seen as oppressive both to the domestic working classes, 
who was suffering, suffering from a severe depression and unemployment at home in Britain, and to overseas native races, um, who were suffering from a newly aggressive uh, British foreign policy with military interventions in South Africa, Afghanistan, Egypt, not to mention increasing police terror in Ireland. So utopian socialism was, in other words, an alliance, quite simply, of race and class politics based on the perception that empire and capital were bound together in an unholy dyad. But more surprising, I mean, we know this now, more surprising, more interesting, that this dyad was best opposed not through a coherent ideology or a revolutionary party or program, but rather by certain kinds of very intimate, small-scale lifestyles or ways of life or practices of self. Vegetarianism, homosexuality, votes for women, <laughs> anti-vivisectionism, celibacy for men, <laughs> dress reform, and spiritualism among them. Sandals were important, but more of this in a moment. An intriguing comment of 1897 by uh, the English Labour leader Robert Blanchford uh, conveys the uh, texture of this movement. Allow me to quote Blanchford. He says, we have the right to refuse the name socialist to those who have not grasped the economic truth, but you must widen your definition of socialism. You must draw out all the ethical and spiritual implications of these efforts and desires for a juster social order. A new conception of life is taking shape." Unquote. This emphasis on the inner life of egalitarian politics was simply ubiquitous at this time. The homosexual socialist radical Edward Carpenter thus described democracy itself, and I'm quoting him, as a thing of the heart rather than a political creed. And Oscar Wilde, of course, very famously spoke of the singular importance of the soul of socialism. Now, of the many, many ways we have to characterize this um, erstwhile radicalism of lifestyle, inner life, practices, self-work, I find it most useful to describe it as a movement for and of global ethical consciousness. I'm using the word global in a special case way to mean cross-cultural, transnational, and cosmopolitan, of course, but also to summon that uh, notion, that trope of uh, interconnection between self and world, self and others, that I mentioned at the outset. So what are the key features of this um, global ethical consciousness at the turn of the previous century? And I'm going to move on from that moment. Uh, two come to mind. A, as I said, a connection between domestic and overseas causes, and the view that there is a symbiosis, or homeostasis even, between iniquities of class, caste, gender, sexuality, race, and so on. Actually. This is a really old and precious idea. Um, and while it's very important to beat up on Europe, it's also very important to um, recuperate its legacies. And uh, I'm very fond of uh, the Chartists. And we must always uh, remember the Chartists in 1848, um, when these revolutions were sweeping across Europe. And uh, um, the, the, some Chartists formed a group called the Fraternal Democrats, as interested in, in, in universal suffrage at home and the cause of um, revolutionary emigrants from other nationalities. This is a long, it's a small tradition, but it's very precious. And we must take very good care of it. B, second feature, a deep conviction about the political uses of occult correspondence. I mean, quite literally sympathetic magic. You know, people have said, by occult do you mean Occult, and I, I mean occult, sympathetic magic. Okay. Namely, and I mean, I'm really 
want you to, to, to take this literally, that the making and wearing of a certain kind of handcrafted sandals, or the saving of a single rabbit from vivisection, or this careful self-exemption from gender fixity, Carpenter calls it hyper-masculinity and hyper-femininity, simultaneously advances the cause of Irish independence, and diminishes the potency of industrial capitalism, produces incalculable anti-imperial effects. These twinned beliefs about the contagious nature of individual and collective coexistence were, of course, strongly influenced by the revolutionary and popular Darwinism of the time, with its hypothesis of the entangled web of life, an argument that highly specific or localized actions, I know Ultra Red was talking about this, um, highly specific or localized actions, say, a woodpecker's pecking of a troublesome bark protecting a forward-thinking carpenter ant has evolutionary consequences for species life itself. Uh, that is to say, um, to use the technical terms, that all ontogenesis is phylogenetic. Or that my personal gestation is somehow inextricable from world consciousness. Which is why you have to care for the self. Now, this knowledge, Edward Carpenter believed, is the secret of democracy. Um, and it's why friendship is important. Um, but to quote Carpenter, I immediately saw, or rather felt, that this region of self existing in me existed equally, though not always consciously, in others. Um, and for him, the friend was the person in whom you felt this shared consciousness. There was no obligation, no institution, uh, uh, no children to produce, um, no state to maintain. But, um, you had this experience of shared consciousness. Um, and, you know, in this period, there are lots of wonderful examples. A mad Indian physicist called, uh, well, actually, physicist turned botanist called J.C. Bose, who was all the rage in his moment. Uh, considered his main scientific mission to be the demonstration of shared life energy even amongst the most apparently inanimate substances. He would have been here at this conference, actually. Um, he conducted a series of public art experiments um, in which he showed himself catching the mood of the recording machine, or crescograph, he was using to measure the nervous affective response of plants or influencing by his own psychic state the disposition of the plant or other substance, tinfoils he liked very much, under observation. So, in affective communities, some of which some of you have read, I began the work of tracking this global ethical consciousness, and I've been following its transmission and transmutation ever since. Um, and I want to move just 10 years after the material of affective communities um, to plot this journey. So in recent years, I was struck by its intriguing reappearance, albeit an altered form, in the early part of the 20th century, that ugly and wonderful century. Um, the guild and syndicalist socialisms that we find at the very beginning of this century, actually, um, explicitly named themselves to be ethical socialisms. So what was going on in this slightly later period? Let me again summarize two features, um, which plot the similarity with the fin de siècle proper and some changes, because it is a delicate thing. J.C. Bost was right, and every detail matters. Two features then. One, global ethical consciousness got a bit more global. <laughs> Um, it started to extend beyond the geographical ambit of European radicals to include other participant worlds, um, the worlds of their friends, actually. Um, an example is the um, cosmopolitan and interfaith group around M.K. Gandhi's South African periodical, Indian Opinion. Um, who were involved in various very assiduous practices of slow reading, which they believed to be a prophylactic 
against the violent speed and communicational tempo or temporality of global imperialism. Um, so the Indian opinion published news that wasn't news. Um, it was very interested in slowing things down. I just want to elaborate this point, if I may, with your permission, a little bit. Uh, you know, um, uh, the um, historian and philosopher uh, Fernand uh, Brodel, who's having a big comeback, uh, has, um, he's the sort of father of globalization theory in a way, um, has famously described world time as the temporality of those extraordinary and powerful events that can change a whole era. Wars, scientific discoveries, economic reversals, and so on. But Gandhi and his international collaborators saw world time very differently. And again, we had some beautiful thoughts about time in the previous uh, presentation. Well, this thought saw world time as the temporality not of important or extraordinary things, but the temporality in which everyone matters. That's what made it global. Everyone mattered. I'll come back to this idea. Um, in which everyone matters and concerning those ordinary material events, common civility, conflict resolution amongst friends, families, strangers, that actually transform the texture of everyday life for everybody. And this was world time. Precisely the unimportant things, precisely the little things that get excluded. Um, okay, second shift in this period I'm talking about. There's a, there's a change in the direction of global consciousness. Um, you know, fantasy at utopian socialism was fundamentally directed at the well-being of victims. This is... Um, and this made it self-reforming and upbeat and joyful, in the way we all feel when we are able to shed our worst selves. But by the early 20th century, there was a um, strange new emphasis on healing and curing oppressors. With this shift, toward cultivating care and regard for those who cause harm and pain in the world, there comes a significant change of mood and style, a sort of edgy realism, um, or anti-romanticism, enters the world of ethical politics. And this is a problem I've been thinking about a lot. Um, and it's required a certain amount of soul searching uh, about the critical methodologies that are currently available to us from the field of Western moral and political philosophy. And in what remains of this discussion, I'd like to talk some more about this particular problem and where it has brought me. And I, let me say again, it's a problem that becomes very clear in the early 20th century, uh, but there are carryovers from the fantasy of and I'll refer to some of these. Okay. So, um, I just want to talk about some tools, um, um, theoretical, philosophical tools. Um, I've benefited a great deal um, in all my work from the so-called ethical turn in critical theory. Um, and I, I don't want to provide you with a shopping list, but very briefly, a few sentences. Uh, when one says ethical turn in the context of critical theory, it immediately conjures the powerful strain of, again, continental, alterity-based, post-metaphysical philosophy. And there are many signposts for this. Um, uh, all of this was provoked, you know, in, in one way by um, Hegel's influential parable of the master-slave dialectic in his massive and unreadable <laughs> phenomenology of spirit. Um, and it was very productive through the 20th century, you know. It was taken up by transcendental ph phenomenologists, Husserl, uh, existence ontologists, and of course, by the existentialists. Um, and it concatenated most precisely around the profound other regard of a Martin Buber or an Emmanuel Levinas, Jacques Derrida, all of whom have been very beautifully reanimated by the thinker Judith Butler um, in her work on precarious and grievable life. So much for that. Um, now, alterity ethics, 
was very, very helpful to me when working in affective communities on the colonizer morality of xenophilia, or friendship toward subjugated foreigners, strangers, and insignificant others. But it was strikingly less helpful when mapping the multicultural turn and reversed directionality of 20th century global ethical consciousness. So why? Now, this accent on otherness, we're talking about otherness, this accent on otherness as the privileged figure of ethics has haunted the post-colonial theories of the past few decades as an ameliorative disposition directed toward those who are historic, from those who are historically powerful toward those who are historically powerless, or who have suffered and continue to suffer injury. Plaintiffs. Three considerations ensue in the context of this that I, I want to um, gather together schematically under the subheadings passivity, the problem of passivity, the problem of reciprocity, and the problem of comparatism. Very quickly. Um, passivity. So ethical programs of other regard, uh, and of the keen concepts of hospitality and cosmopolitanism, implicitly assume the ethical passivity of those at the receiving end of violence, in all its historical variety. So the other of alterity theory, the guest of hospitality theory, or the stranger of neo-cosmopolitan theory may well inspire the ethical action, indeed the ethical heroism of the reformed host cosmopolitan subject. But she herself is alarmingly ethically inert. Only the un, uh, reciprocating uh, uh, recipient of expensive moral gifts. And gifts are very difficult things. Problem number two, reciprocity. Thus, ethical programs of other regard do not quite engage the resources of victim consciousness. What then, this is the question, was the question at the turn of the 20th century, well, yes, the start of the 20th century, what then is involved in disposing ourselves ethically in relation to oppressors, perpetrators, masters, and sovereigns? How can we produce an ethics of suffering in which solidarities have to be formed nauseatingly enough with perpetrators? In which the moral subject has to interject an ethical synapse between her experience of powerlessness and her desire for revenge and reversal? That too is a kind of ethical work. That's where the work of nonviolence begins. Such ethical conundrums, or rather, these desires for ethical agency for everybody, colonizer and colonized, as Albert Memmi put it, um, were at the heart of early 20th century anti-colonial thought and politics. And they were often formalized as the following scandalous, thrilling question. How can we save Europe from its worst self? This is a question whose history needs to be written. You know, it's a question in which Europeans and non-Europeans participated. This was the problem. How, how can we save what is most precious about Europe? Because it was precious. It was felt to be precious, even in the colonial world. And yet it was ruining itself. So in his The Wretched of the Earth, the Martinican revolutionary, Franz Fanon, famously argues that the colonial world must desist for the moment from imitating Europe on the advice of European radicals. He says it's no good sending back a reflection of, of a society and a thought from which time to time um, Europeans themselves feel sickened. So for Europe, for ourselves and for humanity, uh, we must work out together, collaboratively, new concepts and set afoot a new man, advisedly. Aimé Césaire, another Martinican uh, radical, um, uh, argues 
uh, that even more uh, than the colonized, it is the colonizer who is brutalized, de degraded, degraded by, 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 by totalitarianism. Um, now, these ideas, to go back to the fin de siècle, actually were very rich uh, in the animal rights movement. Um, the um, uh, crank, Henry Salt, um, makes a similar case in a, in a pamphlet he wrote called um, Animal Rights. <laughs> considered in relation to social progress. And he argues that all enlightened social reform has a twofold task. First, it must seek amnesty for the objects of injustice, of course. And second, it must protect the subjects of injustice from their own worst selves. He says, terrible as is the lot of the subjects of cruelty and injustice, that of the perpetrators is even worse by reason of the debasement and degradation of character implied and incurred." Unquote. Okay, problem number three of comparatism. Um, all, so far, I mean, I can't say all, you know, um, uh, the way academics do. You know, um, all, um, um, a lot of our thinking <laughs> about putative others um, is as yet strikingly non-comparatist. You know, um, and I want to draw attention in this context, just to throw in here into the pond, um, the, uh, uh, an underthought precedent of, of, um, an, an, of say, Asian theories of non-dualism, which might be helpful in trying to map this uh, reversed ethics. Um, you know, this concerns a set of overlapping heterodox orthodox philosophies, um, um, some post-Vedic and recognizably Buddhist, and some Sufi that calls simultaneously for practices of unselfing, we all know that, and unothering uh, as the formula for enlightened global consciousness on, on the argument that we are, of course, never merely ourselves. Yet, strictly speaking, there are no others. Now, in this thinking, it's really not great to be afflicted by e egoism. Um, but, the perception of too much otherness is also a failure of ethical understanding um, on the premise that the egalitarian subject of enlightenment should be able to identify with all beings and all things. To cut a long story short, um, the very ethical maneuvers which may have initially shown us uh, a path um, to um, post-colonial elaboration um, run the risk of um, becoming provincial, you know. Um, and since our theme today concerns alternative models to a dominant globalization paradigm, let me submit that it is our shared problem to find a creative path to a, a more culturally diverse, transnational, and more globally conscious uh, ethical term in critical theory, to say the least. I don't have any ready solutions at hand, but in the process of my own thinking, I found surprising um, avenues in the late, the last work of um, the philosopher Michel Foucault. Uh, I don't know if these findings are generalizable, but uh, they've done a lot for me. So let me share some provisionally as the sign of an alternative. Uh, and in so doing, I'll also describe the linked concern of the book I've just finished, um, called The Common Cause. So, you know, there's been a lot of interest over the last few years in uh, the ethical turn of Foucault's last lectures um, on Diogenes, which he delivered at the Collège de France, but also at Berkeley in the early 1980s. Um, and, you know, some people say, well, this was just a kind of inconsistent strain in his uh, thinking. It was like a viral case of humanism. Um, uh, but actually, I think uh, there's reason to believe that these unfolding, um, these lectures, uh, are uh, the connective tissue for his entire oeuvre. Um, um, we can talk about that after, afterwards. Um, and you know, we can recast this corpus as a, a telescoped history, if you like, of, of, of modern cynicism good modern cynicism uh, as uh, something we should all be. Uh, which, you know, ends, of course, in Foucault's praise of the scandalous lifestyle of Diogenes of Sinope. Um, 
uh, and begins uh, with praise of the heterodox moral life recommended, and as it happened in Foucault's version, practiced by Immanuel Kant, whom he praised um, very early on as the exemplary dandy um, of moral philosophy. Um, um, okay. So what is this moral cynicism that I'm um, recommending in the name of uh, Michel Foucault? Okay. First, what does it do for us? First, in view of, of my discussion so far about the reversed directionality of 20th century radical ethics, it's very, very important that Foucauldian cynicism is actually an ethics of fallen figures. The victim, the underdog, the injured party. You know, it comes, as he says, from below, and it's directed above. You know, it's about the um, uh, re reformation of kings. And its bearer, Foucault uh, writes, is the man with the staff, always the man, but the man with the staff, the cloak, the man in sandals or bare feet, the man with the long beard, the dirty man, he is also the man who roams, who is not integrated into society, has no household, family, hearth or country, and is also a beggar. It's the ethics of the pauper. Second, there is an almost inadvertent yet irresistible transnationalism in um, Foucault's hypothesis of modern cynicism. But again, um, uh, you know, for this uh, most Eurocentric of thinkers, um, it's the rare occasion on which he admits to the reforming, if not civilizing, effects of contact for, um, for Europe. Uh, and especially in his Berkeley lectures of October, November 18, uh, 1983, he discredits, and I, I want to give you this example um, because it is generative, uh, discredits the traditional ex explanation given for the rise of cynic sects as a um, you know, negative form of aggressive individualism which arose with the collapse of the political structures of the ancient world. But there's a far more interesting account, he argues, that explains the appearance of the cynics on the Greek philosophical scene as a consequence of the expanding Macedonian Empire. More specifically, he notes that with Alexander's conquests, various um, South Asian philosophies, especially the monastic and ascetic teachings of sects that he calls, that are called in the sources, the gymn gymnosophists, uh, became familiar to the Greeks. Um, it's very exciting to find this detail, and um, it helps um, to think of contact as far back as possible, um, and to think of cynicism itself as a transnational credo of, um, of produced by ancient imperialism. Um, third, beside the gesture at East-West comparatism, there's another more general and profound way in which these later themes in Foucault are structurally global, you know, uh, in the sense of positing, as I said in an earlier iteration of this term, a truly inclusive outlook. And these can be communicated, and I think this is the kernel of what I want to share. These can be communicated under um, the headings theoretical life, ameliorative universalism, and the slightly um, um, tongue twisting one, desubjectification, becoming not yourself, without the via media of alterity. Let me just speak very briefly um, to these, and I'm happy to speak more uh, afterwards. Theoretical life. As a type of embodied theory, again, it's this wonderful word that the ultra red presenters uh, emphasized uh, a lot. It's a type of embodied theory or a philosophical way of life. Um, Foucauldian cynicism opens up a democratic field of analysis, which incorporates a truly wide range of non-expert, everyday, maverick behaviors and practices within moral philosophy. You know, he says the high value which the cynics attributed to a person's way of life 
um, does not mean that they had no in interest in theoretical philosophy, but reflects their view that the manner in which a person lived was a touchstone of their relation to truth. Which is to say that under this dispensation, everybody and every kind of way of living can stake a claim to ethics. Hosts and guests, colonizers and colonized, princes and paupers. Ameliorative universalism. So modern cynicism is also universalizing and globalizing simply in its aspiration to exceed fixed or inherited laws, geographies, and histories. You know, to analyze the limits that are imposed on us and to exceed them at every moment, however we do it. Um, and as such, you know, this very idiosyncratic um, and very particularizing ethical posture competes not primarily, and as I thought for a long time, you know, with the um, transcendental neutrality of, of the public sphere or of politics proper, you know, um, where we all have to overcome um, our, our private nature. It doesn't compete with this at all. But what it competes with is actually another normative kind of ethics. Um, code or custom-oriented ethics. Don't dress like that. Um, don't love like that. Um, um, don't spend your money like that. Don't not spend your money like that. The nomos or nomisma of convention and currency. That is why Diogenes was charged, quite literally, with um, defacing the currency, with being a coin changer. Three, desubjectification, how not to be yourself, without the via media of alterity, without grabbing on real and hypothetical others in order to be ethical all the time. So, to go back to my previous point, if conventional, conventional or normative ethics provides the conditions under which only certain privileged subjects can attain to self-care and the good life, you know, uh, under the auspices, the ghastly auspices of the caste, system in, in, in ancient India, um, only some were entitled to be ethical um, upon the, the, because only some had the privilege, privileged access to certain uh, austerities and formalities. Okay. So against this sort of ethics, cynic ascesis tends in the opposite direction as an anti-care of the self in which there is no regard for utility or custom, and which designates a way out, an exit, from all received truths. Okay. So to this extent, it sometimes involves the work on yourself here, the self-work that makes us global. Um, sometimes concerns onerous, very difficult practices of auto-dissembly. Um, of releasing oneself from oneself um, and or, or, or straying afield from or deserting oneself. Um, you know, the late the Derrida had this uh, wonderful conceit uh, of autoimmunity, of uh, becoming immune to yourself. <laughs> uh, you don't need any others. I'm not saying you should do away with others, by the way, but just to follow this thought through. Learn how to uh, become immune to your own self. So in summary then, in this um, other body of ethical thought that is just coming into view, we can find a unique program for a democratic, inclusive, and transnational ethics of the victim or underdog that furthermore consists of key oppositions between self-care on the one hand and self-ruination on the other or between the good life and the scandalous and eccentric life on the other. Um, before I move on, I want to say it's very uh, important to me to be speaking to artists because um, we share, those of us who are artists, those of us who work on ethics and interest in practices, um, and I'm describing here practices, um, practices that are 
technical and sometimes artistic. Um, all of these features have uh, helped me very much to understand a, a conundrum of early 20th century ethics. Um, you know, um, that ghastly time. I, I think we haven't thought about how ghastly it was, how um, you know, Han Hannah Arendt uh, touched upon it when she spoke of the totalitarianisms um, that were coming into view and that have still not really left us. They still linger. Um, and I, I, with this model, I've been able to, um, to understand this scene in its global context as a kind of obscured wrangle between two kinds of ethics, really. Not between those who were not ethical and those who were ethical. Between two kinds of self-work, if you like. One, the high culture, the normative, custom-oriented, uh, regulatory culture of imperial fascist moral perfectionism, which was global and ubiquitous. It, there are versions of it everywhere. There were great followers of imp imperialism and fascism in, in, the, in the colonized world. India certainly. Many were drawn to this um, high life. Um, many uh, post-colonial nationalisms absorbed this uh, ethics of moral perfectionism. You know, this is India for Indians. Um, uh, and so on. On the other hand, we have its antagonist. And that is the small story that needs to be told and uncovered and actually lived out, um, which concerns cosmopolitan and democratic moral imperfectionism on the other. Not necessarily self and other, but moral perfectionism, which is all about making yourself about rank and priority and worth and affluence and height, and perfection, excellence, um, rarity, uh, exclusivity, um, and ruining yourself <laughs> on the other, um, uh, so as to opt out of the rewards that moral perfectionism was offering. <coughs> Let me gloss this a little bit. So, in the troubled transnational milieu, born of the early 20th century scramble and spread for empire, the concept of ethics had obtained, quite simply, a ubiquitous application. Again, I want to loosen up the notion of ethics. It was no longer the denominator. It was never meant to be, and it certainly was not the denominator of good or bad behaviors, merely. Right and wrong. Rather, it described all projects of disciplined self-work in which private arts of living achieved or could achieve a collective resonance. So extremists, moderates, radicals alike held subjective properties to be universalizable and projected self-cultivation as a work not just upon the self but also upon others. So, you know, uh, there, let me, you know, there are, there, there are, um, many examples, I'll come to those later, but it, it, let me say, um, in the midst of this stylistic ethical variety, sympathizers and bearers of anti-democratic programs defended an elite ethics of self-consolidation um, and perfectionism, which distinguished rare individuals from the common lot. You know, there were many ways of doing this. There are many ways of distinguishing rare individuals from the common lot, ghastly and various. By contrast, in diverse quarters, um, global quarters, um, yet always anti-fascist and always anti-colonial, many of them non-Western, many of them Western, uh, democracy was itself refashioned as a counter-ethics or spiritual regimen of, um, of imperfection aimed at making common cause both with the victims and abettors of unjust sociality, by defending the former and reforming the latter. So everywhere in this dense, overlapping archive, there's this recurring emphasis on, on botching, botching your own perfection, making a mess of things, um, uh, so as to undo the totalitarian and materialist hubris of the times. Gandhian practices of slow reading is an example. 
you know, let's not produce the news. Let's have a newspaper that doesn't produce the news. It's a small example. Um, let's have a political movement that doesn't have an end, that doesn't have an outcome, to borrow a word from earlier. And so often, though not always, this emphasis comes from those who are already in one way or another socially and institutionally living on the other side of perfection. And rank, value and affluence, power and privilege. So where can we find examples of these practices? It's actually very tricky. But when you sort of find them, you see them everywhere. Um, um, I don't want to itemize them one by one, though I'll be happy to provide you with examples of moral imperfectionism as a global ethics to follow, as a kind of modern cynicism. But I just want to point to uh, three transnational nodes, three events, uh, which are thick with practices of moral imperfectionism uh, at the, um, in the first half of the 20th century. One is this very curious animal, the 1893 uh, Chicago Parliament of Religions, um, which provides a very important charter for nonviolent collectivity. It brought together all the, actually, all the heterodox uh, believers um, of the world. Um, to Chicago, um, and uh, um, in order to show how many truths the various faiths hold in common and to bring the nations of the earth into a more friendly fellowship in the hope of securing permanent international peace. It's quite crazy. This is the high point of empire. Um, and uh, there were all these people with sort of staffs and tussocks and tonsors um, wandering about, freezing Chicago weather. Um, one notable speaker at this convention, the Indian monk, Swami Vivekananda, put out an urgent, uh, prescient appeal, uh, given what was going to happen in the next few decades, for global amnesty in advance toward the persecuted and the refugees of all religions and all the nations of the earth. It was a call at that moment for, uh, for, for, for the colonized world to resist the temptation of nationalism. Um, it's terribly important. Uh, he was always doing that, so to stop it from forming itself. That's a kind of self-ruination. Um, uh, because he knew what would come with nationalism's uh, contagious perfectionism. Um, second example around the, the First World War and after, the absolutely international interwar cultures of pacifism, born of perpetual world war. Um, and, you know, it, it, during the First World War, it's very cool to be a pacifist. In the Second World War, it's not. Um, and these were remarkable people. Um, they, um, who were uh, trying to practice an ethics of neutrality, um, uh, where your job in, in your own bedroom, coffee cup, um, was to remain neutral, um, uh, which uh, uh, was described by a, a Quaker pacifist um, from the moment as uh, uh, the belief, neutrality as the belief that power comes in giving up power. That's a kind of self ruination. You take sides, uh, you um, uh, win the uh, rewards of heroism. Um, but it was very important for these pacifists um, to practice neutrality. That's one example of uh, imperfectionism. A third scene very closely linked to pacifism <laughs> are the great and amazing, actually mid 20th century, uh, movements, proto-movements for civil rights and liberties in America. And I, I think we probably can't, we probably not said enough about, uh, about these movements. Um, um, and uh, many, many of these um, figures were pacifists. And uh, uh, in that scene, uh, they practiced um, um, theaters of cross-identification where uh, 
you had to, as the pacifists had taught, to become everybody. Um, the person who is beaten up, the person who does the beating, uh, the man, the woman, um, to become everybody. Um, uh, why? Why? <laughs> Uh, not just so that you weren't scared uh, when at the receiving end of violence, though that is important too, um, but for a shared global public sphere in which, and I'm quoting from um, uh, the activist, Bayard Rustin, nobody is defeated. Everybody shares in the victory. Uh, and again, this is an extraordinary vision. But as you can see, it's anti-romantic, uh, but it is an extraordinary vision. Um, there were very many convergences across these elements. But if there's one person, and I really, uh, th this seems to be uh, irresistibly the case, through whom all these um, uh, elements combined, um, it, it is the anti-imperial leader Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi. Uh, and these stories belong to his life, not as the kind of great saint of Indian nationalism, but as this, this crankish person who was working on himself in very peculiar ways. Um, you know, he, he participated, and it concerns him and his friends, his European friends, his American friends, his South African friends, his Indian friends, his Hindu friends, his Muslim friends. Um, he participates avidly in the world of fin de siècle, lifestyle-based socialism does the whole vegetarianism, nature cure thing. Um, in the early 20th century, he haunts in London <laughs> uh, the ethical uh, societies favored by Belle Epoque socialists and new liberals. Um, he's in ardent conversation with an American crank called William Salter, who's actually crazy brother-in-law of William James. Um, and also uh, 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 the, a lecturer for the um, Ethical Culture Society in Chicago, and uh, a tremendous force beh behind race reform in America in 1909. Uh, by 1920s, uh, Gandhi is fully immersed in pacifist, uh, in, in pacifist ethics. You know, in America, through the labors of a, uh, a man called uh, uh, John Haynes Holmes, uh, now forgotten, but very important. Um, and on the continent, of course, through the efforts of the um, uh, French thinker and activist, Romain Hollande. You know, indeed, by the 1920s, he is uh, something of um, uh, what we might call an apparatus or uh, um, a total artwork, you know, is it? Uh, 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 for the heterogeneous ensemble. Um, the discourses, the institutions, uh, the craft, the design, the theories, the practices, the statements and disciplines of moral imperfectionism. Um, he is where it all seems to um, circulate. Um, and co commentators uh, and participants in this ensemble regularly drew attention to two features of his own oeuvre that sort of caught uh, um, uh, all these various elements of moral imperfectionism. The first was his accent on the ethicization or spiritualization of politics. Um, and the second, Martin Buber was very taken with this. Uh, the second, which is far more interesting in a way, is his emphasis on an ethics of self-reduction. You know, so for instance, in an essay of 1918, the um, British uh, ethical socialist Gilbert Murray praised Gandhi as the auteur of a new kind of soul force that provides impu immunity against riches, comfort, praise, and possessions. Such a man, he said, is dangerous as there is no way of making him any smaller than he already is. Um, Let me end with a very small anecdote concerning Gandhi and the Portuguese writer, Fernando Pessoa. You know, very much an exemplar of Foucauldian moral uh, cynicism, modern cynicism. Pessoa is now very well acknowledged for his heteronymic project. You know, he wrote in all these various names, um, where each new name, each new heteronym, uh, 
cleared his given personality and took him further and further afield from himself as a forever changing, never ending work in progress. Um, so rather than uh, following the path of an evolutionary single self, he just mutated on the side um, by writing these various names that undid each other. And he's praised variously by various thinkers now as the creative um, voice of a destructive European century. Um, but it's little acknowledged that Gandhi and Pessoa overlapped in Durban, of all places, in the last years of the 19th century. Um, but Pessoa didn't forget this. When he was around 40 and fully immersed in the bottle, um, he took some notes on a piece of paper for an essay that, like much of his work, never got published, essay on Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi. And this is what he has to say is of great interest uh, since, and I've learned this from his biographer, Richard Zenith, you know, one, this author did not dish out praise easily, particularly not to living figures, and two, he himself was very staunchly Western in his models and references, and three, he was really not interested in political and social reform. But this is what Fernando Pessoa wrote about Gandhi. Only two fragments are available. One passage scorns the so-called noteworthy eminences of the era, amongst them the American automobile industrialist Henry Ford and the um, politician uh, Georges Clemenceau, who led France to victory in World War I. I quote from Pessoa, Dos those Fords and those Clemenceaus and those mere humans into the trash, which is what they are. In another passage, he calls Gandhi, and I quote, the only truly great figure in the world today because prevailing standards of greatness are as nothing to him. An unarmed hero, he puts rust on our countless swords, rifles, and cannons. With his single, whole, una, firm will, he hovers above our political intrigue in times of danger, our accidental firmness, our drunken bouts of achievement. Our drunken bouts of achievement, unquote. Elsewhere, clarifying these fragmentary remarks under the sign of a distinctly Gandhian apparatus, he offers us the following paradox. The less effort we spend on our own glory and triumph, that is, on fulfilling and realizing the self, the more we become a little larger than the entire universe. Says friends, a little larger than the entire universe. Our cosmological purpose, in other words, is secreted in living a minor life and doing incidental things. So too, Gandhi once noted, the liberated individual, he said, is like a drop in the ocean that small and that vast, too. So, an ethics of non-achievement is certainly one alternative model to a dominant globalization paradigm. It has a rich history, and it may well point us in the direction of a work to be done. Thank you for listening.